Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Those of you that join us remotely or in a virtual way, we're also thankful that you are present, as it were, in that capacity. But thank you to each one of you who join us here in person. Hope you've had a good day. Thank you for uh, the kind remarks that were made about the lesson this morning and its helpfulness. We give God the glory and the praise uh, for that. Your other uh, means of encouragement and your continued uh, love and support of us, uh, and I speak of myself and Amy and the boys, is so uh, very appreciated. And I don't tell you that probably near enough. Jesus is without doubt the master teacher. Even those who would never render allegiance or give obedience to his teaching, nevertheless, upon critical examination of the manner and methods that he employed, agree. Yes, there has never been a teacher quite like the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the things that he was especially skilled at doing, and everything he did, of course, showed the utmost and greatest skill, but he would often take everyday objects and use them to make spiritual lessons and application for our lives. Even in our prayer, it was mentioned, and we recall how Jesus said we are like salt, or we should be, both to flavor and to influence, yes, and to preserve. And if that quality is lacking, if the salt, that is, our lives, are without taste or flavor, we likewise would be of little benefit, in fact, useless to the Lord. So many other object lessons and things from everyday life uh, Jesus used. And tonight, I want, as we typically do, to look at this second Sunday night lesson, an object lesson. And I'll get my object out. I had to hide it so that no one would see it beforehand. But here it is. It's that time of year, isn't it? And yes, that is a pumpkin. That is my jack-o'-lantern. It is not real. You can hear it's ceramic. And the reason why, the elders put down new carpet, and I knew if I had a real pumpkin, the first thing I'd do is gesticulate, which is just a big fancy word for throwing your arm out when you make a point. And the pumpkin would go flying, and uh, uh, the Bell family would be splattered, and the new carpet would be ruined. So uh, nevertheless, we're going to see if he'll sit right there. And he may break, and if he... Yeah, that's precarious. Let's do... Uh, there we go. Let's try that. All right. Uh, pumpkins. What do you say, preacher? Pumpkins and Christians, now you're going too far. And I know you've said that before in most of these lessons, but let's see, digging in a little deeper uh, tonight. Uh, nearby, uh, most of you uh, are aware of the Pumpkin Festival. Uh, I guess that's the official name of it, held in Allert. And uh, some of you might have even been present Saturday before last, back on October the 3rd, uh, when the weigh-in was conducted. And at the conclusion of that event, here Mr. Bruce Terry, I don't know him, of Helenwood, Tennessee, he broke the record. His pumpkin weighed a mere 1,731.8 pounds. Uh, that's a pretty good-sized jack-o'-lantern. I guess you'd have to have a chainsaw to carve that rascal. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we are familiar with this uh, usual image associated with this time of year. Now, you may not be familiar with what the backstory is, and admittedly, uh, as I tried to do a little research, I didn't know much of this until just recently, and there is conflicting uh, opinion in folklore where it comes from. Uh, one suggestion that seems to get a lot of play is that the jack-o'-lantern is named after the Irish legend of Stingy Jack. And Stingy Jack was an interesting character. He so tricked and deceived the devil that uh, the devil wouldn't let him go to hell when he died, uh, but he was so unsavory that God wouldn't let him go to heaven. Well, you can see that is for sure uh, folklore, but he's doomed to roam the earth. And according to this Irish tradition, the only thing that he would have to light his way was a hollowed out, not pumpkin, turnip. That's what the Irish legend says, and that would have to be a fairly large turnip as well to be able to put some form of illumination in it, but uh, that's where Stingy Jack and maybe the jack-o'-lantern idea comes from. Another uh, suggestion is the Will of the Wisps, which in uh, folklore, even throughout the world in different places, uh, not just in the English-speaking world, uh, refers to the way that strange lights would be seen, especially uh, if you're thinking about England and Ireland, Scotland, that part of the world, around bogs. Uh, low-lying areas where the water would collect and what's guessed, uh, I guess Miss Linda could tell us about the bioluminescent uh, decay of organic matter and how some of those things interact with the atmosphere and different gases uh, to produce kind of a glow, if you will. And the will of the wisps comes down to some as uh, the predecessor of the jack-o'-lantern. Which of those is right? I don't know. 
Well, all I knew is uh, mom and daddy would say, let's go carve a jack-o'-lantern. Don't cut your fingers off uh, when you do, uh, but, you know, do that. And we did, and we enjoyed that activity, and maybe you do too. Let me give you four ideas tonight. And you can share these with your children or grandchildren, just you yourself the next time uh, you buy one at Lowe's to decorate, or maybe if you've already carved one this year. The first one is this. We're handpicked. You know, there's a beautiful teaching that permeates both the Old and the New Testament. It's brought into full expression when we, of course, see uh, the culminating work of Jesus, His death on the cross on our behalf. But it's this. God has always had a plan, and it's included you. He has hand-picked, hand-selected you to be a part of His plan. Now, that idea, unfortunately, is misunderstood. And today, the big word that's usually associated with that concept is pre destination. If you'll be turning to Ephesians chapter 1, you will see that word utilized and uh, you will be able hopefully to see how it can be easily misunderstood. But if we'll look at a context larger than just one phrase, I hope I'll be able to explain to you uh, with ease what is in play in this idea. But we are hand-picked. Now when you're picking a pumpkin, that's a very important task. If you've never had the joy of watching your toddler uh, pick through five gazillion pumpkins to find the right one, then you don't know what you're missing. Uh, they all look the same to us as we get older, but when those little ones are looking, it has to be just right, doesn't it? It has to be the right uh, shape. It has to have the right color and uh, variation in various other qualities that they are looking for. And that right one is out there, and they take a little while sometimes trying to discover it. In Ephesians chapter 1, we can't read the entirety of the chapter, but we're going to highlight most of it. So just take your Bible and let your eyes settle there on it with me. Paul's writing to the Christians at Ephesus, and uh, this is where that idea, especially espoused by those influenced by the teachings of John Calvin, would say predestination is their idea that God selected before the uh, beginning of the world those who would be the elect or the saved and those who would be the damned, the lost. And man has no part to play in the matter, Calvinism asserts. And God has made that choice for you and for me, for all people. And we are not uh, even permitted to lodge any sort of complaint against it. If we are among the saved, then hey, you're in good shape. Heaven is going to be your home. It doesn't matter really how you live. Now, you should live good, they say, a, a good moral life, but it's not required. But if you're one of the lost, one of the condemned, even uh, that doctrine would teach Jesus didn't even die for you. How they even suggest that God loves you. Some would say God loves you in His glory so as just to show His holiness by punishing you eternally. Well, you can easily grasp how some people without a knowledge of God's Word, if they heard those sorts of ideas promoted or presented, they would throw up their hands and say, I don't want to serve a God like that. That seems cruel. That seems very unloving. And in fact, it would be. And there's no worse that I can find of philosophy, certainly that wears the name or claims to have any bearing or allegiance to Jesus Christ, espousing what Calvinism does that is more distasteful. But let's uh, let our minds just listen to Paul and to the Holy Spirit as he guides Paul's pen in telling us what this idea is all about. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful, notice please, and some of us we write in our Bibles or circle or underline, highlight, the faithful in, I in, Christ Jesus. That's talking about locative position. In other words, there's a location Paul is writing to people, saints, Christians, those set apart, those who are the faithful in Christ Jesus. That's crucial. Why? He gives this customary greeting, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. Well, who's us? Go back to verse 1, the faithful in Christ Jesus. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So he repeats himself as it were. Every spiritual blessing is to us. Who are the us? Those faithful in Christ Jesus. Where is this? In the heavenly places. Where? In Christ. Just as. Now here's the key verses. Verse 4. Just as He, God, that pronoun is in reference to. Back to verse 3. Chose us in Him. That pronoun's a reference to 
the Lord Jesus Christ. So we might read, Just as God chose us in the Lord Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined, your version may say predestinated, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the beloved and that term the beloved of course is a reference to the beloved Lord Jesus Christ what did God do then verse 4 said he chose us he chose us but that choosing was in a particular place and we don't think of maybe always choosing in a place but this choice relates to the place which is in him and yes it occurred before the foundation of the world before any action that I took or that you took. And it happened so that I might be holy and without blame before God in love. He predestined. And that word, just as it suggests, predestined means the destiny is set beforehand. The course is charted. What is this course? What is this course of action that God set forth for us? Adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. And so this plan of God that included Jesus Christ was so that I might be adopted. Now that word today, of course, in a modern setting, uh, it probably carries a little bit more baggage than uh, what the ancient writers would have understood. But the same idea was extant both in the first century world as it is in the 21st century world. That is, that one who is adopted can be made a part of a family to which he has no, if you will, biological tie. Or he has no real bond that makes him merit or earn a place such as that. Adoption is that free, gracious, loving choice that someone makes to bring the child under their care. And under their guardianship, I can have that relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will because he made me accepted in the beloved. Well, how is that to be accomplished? Do I have any part to play in the matter whatsoever? Keep reading, please. Again, if you circle or highlight or underline, notice verse 7. In him we've been hand-selected. Where? By whom? By what means? In Him, in Christ. We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. It wasn't what I did to make God act as He decided to act, even before I was on the scene. That would be presumptuous. And really this gets at the heart of some of the things that you and I say so often without probably thinking them through to the measure that we ought. Some children of God, as they near death, they'll say, Preacher, have I been good enough to go to heaven? And what that preacher should say is, Absolutely not. Now, that wouldn't be very comforting to someone uh, in their last hours of life, but it's the truth. Have you been good enough to go to heaven? No. Have I? No. Will I ever be good enough to go to heaven? No, not on my own, nor will you. It's in Christ that forgiveness of sins is possible by the blood, the sacrifice of himself on the cross, which he may do abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Now look at verse 9, please. Having made known to us, this is what God has done through Christ, having been made, to own, made known to us the mystery, that is what was not known previously but now has been known, the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Now, Admittedly, here Paul is confusing the pronouns. Is the he and the himself, Jesus or God the Father? I throw up my hands sometimes in frustration. If you're trying to read this in the original language, it's even more perplexing because it's a single sentence all the way from verse 1 down to the end of verse 14. You English teachers, you'd stroke out when you have a run-on sentence of that length. So whichever Paul is meaning really is in some ways immaterial. God the Father is God. God the Son is God. God, God the Spirit, is God. He has made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure which He purposed in Himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of time 
That just means when the right time came, when God unfolded the plan and it came to fruition, He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. Where? In Him. Verse 11, then, in Him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined, there's our word again, according to the purpose of Him who works all things, according to the counsel of His will. Uh, Paul would have been well served if I were advising him. I was not, the Holy Spirit was. If Paul would have just said, those that God saves are those that follow the plan that God has had since the very beginning of time, who enjoy forgiveness in Christ Jesus. That's the summary, that's the distilled truth of Ephesians chapter 1. Now we could keep going, uh, but when you see a pumpkin and you see something hand-selected, hand-picked, that it had to be just right uh, for that little one that's going to you know, carve it and make it their jack-o'-lantern, think about how everything had to be just right, and that's the total unfolding of the scheme of redemption both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, even continuing to the present hour and will not be fully, in some ways, consummated until Jesus returns again Judgment occurs and eternal life in heaven is granted to each of us. We trusted in Christ to the praise of His glory. All of this is in Him. Now, again, read the entirety of the book of Ephesians if you want to see really very simply what that in Him idea conveys. In chapter 2, he tells us we're saved by grace through faith. And there are so many that say, see, I don't have to do anything. God's grace saved me. Well, you're terribly uh, misinformed because if you keep reading, Paul will tell you in Christ Jesus you were far off, but now you've been brought near. You have access now to God. What all God has made available is in His Son, Jesus Christ. And so the question that should jump off the page that Paul takes for granted because he's already taught these people when he was with them on his missionary journey, but what confronts every reader tonight is, how do I get in Christ? Isn't that the question? If it's in Christ, if it's in Him, that all of these blessings are promised, how do I get into Him? I'll only give you one verse because you most likely know this with ease, but help those who may be uninformed. Galatians 6, or rather Galatians 3, verse 26, You are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. But don't stop reading. Read verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into. Into? What does that mean? It means it's put me into something, into Christ, have put on Christ. And so we're hand-selected. And tonight the idea that some have perverted the idea of the predestination of God and said, you're lost, but you're saved, but you're lost, but you're saved, and going on down the line, uh, uh, separate and apart from any response of themselves to his will uh, makes God a terrible respecter of persons, bias, prejudice, arbitrary, unloving. You know, you could heap up all of those things and they would all be true. But the gospel of Jesus Christ, who died for all, is given to all. And all who will obey him can place themselves in him by obedience to his gospel. More could be said and should be said, but let's go on. Here's that second kind of parallel idea. We're washed clean. You ever notice that guy when you go to the pumpkin patch and you bring it up? Some of these fancier places, they actually have a guy designated to do this for you. He's got his little brush and he's probably got a little tub of water there. He's going to scrub all the dirt off your pumpkin. Well, here, if you noticed in Ephesians chapter 1, we have forgiveness. We have forgiveness, redemption through his blood. Forgiveness, a word that means to send away. Now, uh, the New Testament also uses that word, washing, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 5, one of my favorite verses that oftentimes I don't feel like we probably uh, give enough attention to, but Paul uh, giving just a beginning kind of introductory statement to what, or John, I said Paul, excuse me, what John is going to write further. He said he is writing from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the true ruler of the kings of the earth. And then John adds this detail about Jesus. He says of Jesus, It is Him who loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. You might know and might recall, and uh, next week if you come back on Sunday night, I'll remind you again because we'll look at one of our preachers from the past. We're going to look at Brother Marshall Keeble, the famed black evangelist of the last century. 
Brother Keeble said a woman going to wash clothes makes sure she puts the soap in in order to get the clothes clean. He said, you need to put the soap that is the blood of Jesus to wash your soul clean. That's a beautiful illustration, isn't it? And true, just as here John asserts. Isaiah 1 and verse 18, even in the Old Testament, Isaiah said your sins can be like scarlet. They can be red like crimson. But if we give attention to the Word of God, and in our day in the New Testament time, of course, that's the gospel of Jesus, they can be white as wool. They can be washed white as snow. 1 John 1 and verse 7, We walk in the light as He is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, continues to cleanse us from all sin. One of the most impactful lessons that I remember hearing in chapel at Freed Hardeman was from a, a little guy. And uh, he was one of those, I guess, uh, one of those little guys. He wasn't skilled eloquently, uh, much like myself. You know, we couldn't use the big words and arguments like some of the fancier preachers might. But uh, I remember he took as his t uh, text this particular lesson. And he said, you know what I think about? We were all waiting for him to tell us. He said, it's just like the windshield wiper on my car. I walk and he wipes. And he'd go across the stage floor and he'd say, I walk and he wipes. I walk and he wipes. And that made an impression. And that's what here John's telling us. If I live for the Lord, I'll stumble along the way. I have today. You probably have too. I'll make mistakes. I'll make many errors in judgment. But if I keep walking the light, Jesus' blood keeps cleansing me. Is there a grander truth than that? I don't know where you'd find it if there is, and I'm sure there's not. Another passage, and then we'll prove or go to the next point because time proves to be fleeting by quickly. Ephesians chapter 5. That discussion of the relationship between a husband and wife is often the attention we give to this section. And there are many lessons here that all of us need to heed, especially if we are in a marriage relationship. Wives, here are your duties. Husbands, here are your duties. How challenging it is to live by the precepts that this passage gives us. But look at verse 26. Speaking of Jesus and how he loved the church and gave himself for her, according to verse 25, which is how husbands ought to love their wives, he said he did this that he might sanctify and cleanse her, speaking of the church, with the washing of water by the word. For those who sometimes make an objection to the essentiality, for instance, of baptism, and they'll dismiss it and they'll say, there's nothing to that. That's just a big bathtub and you're getting wet. There's nothing at all to do with salvation. Take them to Ephesians 5. Not only is the individual Christian cleansed, Paul tells us that even the church is cleansed by the washing of water by the word. That pumpkin, when he comes out of the field, needs the dirt washed off of him. As I come out of the world, I need the dirt washed off me, sin. He does that in baptism when I obey him, but as I continue to walk... Sometimes that dirt collects, but thanks be to God, He continues to cleanse me from my sins. Number three, God gives us a smile. My little guy's got a little smile there. He's not one of those scary pumpkins. See, he's a, he's a friendly pumpkin. He's got a smile on it. I don't like those that, you know, are carved to look mean. This one looks a little, he looks a little intimidating, but maybe not too bad. God gives us a smile. Now, I'm the guy, much like Charlie Brown. Remember on the Charlie Brown Halloween festival or party, they let him come and he's so excited, but they just use him for a model because, you know, they draw, the, they draw on the back of his head, much like mine, you know, to be able to carve their pumpkin. You can use me for that purpose. If you're that desperate, I'll come to your house over the next few weeks and uh, you can sharpie the back of my head to get a good model for what you want your pumpkin to look like. I, I love you that much. But no, God gives us a smile. Psalm 51 and verse 12 after probably the lowest point of his life. That's debatable, I'm sure, but it, certainly at one of the low points of his life, having been convicted of his sin with not only Bathsheba, but with Uriah, David prays to God. And it's a heartfelt prayer. You can tell that in every syllable. In verse 12, he makes this request. After already asking God for forgiveness, he says to God, Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. I thought a lot about that. The joy of your salvation. Sin had robbed David of that joy that he had previously in salvation. Sin still does that tonight. You can probably think of times in your own life. You may not have committed a sin that was as heinous as the sin of David. You may have. 
If so, the same prayer that he prayed can be prayed by you and your obedience to God's word as the New Testament outlines will produce the same effect of forgiveness of sins that he enjoyed and that prayer for joy again in salvation. God, give it back to me. Psalm 4, David is praying then and we don't know at what stage in his life. But he closes that psalm by saying, There are many who say, Who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. I will both lie down in peace and sleep for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. I think that's just a summary of saying all that the life, all that this world offers, all that life offers us from a physical comfort standpoint. David said that's immaterial that's inconsequential compared to the gladness that God can put in our heart now it might be the critic who says well he was the king he had everything he needed we're not kings tonight and although we are probably more financially blessed than so many in so many other parts of the world no matter if you have a little or a lot God can give you a smile a joy and he wants to do that first Thessalonians 4 and verse 16 Paul just said rejoice evermore Rejoice always. To the Christians at Philippi in chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord when, how, always, and again, just keep doing it, again I say rejoice. And if you're like me, if you're especially like me, uh, since about March of this year, uh, that's a tall order, isn't it? It's a tall order to rejoice. And hopefully... Even though we don't like the current predicament that we're in, and we're longing for it to be different, maybe the Lord would say, just why don't you right now rejoice? That's what I want you to do right now. And in due time, when the time is right, when He knows best, He alone knows best, then He will uh, take this present distress from us. But for now, God gives us a smile. He wants us to be joyful people. And you've heard me say over these last few months that as God's people, if we don't offer anything to the world, if our co-workers and uh, our teammates on the ball field and our classmates at school and our neighbors, if all they ever hear from us is, man, this is terrible, it's awful, it's worse, it's going to get worse uh, yet, and you know when this happens and this is going downhill, will they have any interest? Will they have any notion that Christian life is different. Now, I'm not saying be a Pollyanna and ignore all of the things that are problematic. I'm not saying do that. But if we took a more confident tone, if we took a more joyful tone, would that perhaps pique some interest in those people? And they say, you know, things are just as bad for them as they are for us. We're all in this mess together, but they seem to have some joy that I don't have. They seem to have some optimism. Where, where does that come from? Maybe that would offer us an opportunity uh, to open the door with the gospel. So number three, God gives us a smile. The last point tonight, God shines through us. Check this out. See my candle? Now you probably can't see it because the lights are... Now you can't see it. But there's a candle in there, even though it's a battery-operated candle. And uh, some of you remember, um, my dad was always kind of, um, he, like me, a little weird. And uh, so he rigged up, he just took a, a light socket and he did that and he put a light socket up in there. 150 watt light bulb and a jack-o'-lantern, it's not a good idea, okay? You can have internal pumpkin pie. Now maybe that would have been a chef's dream, a creation, but we had an internal pumpkin pie, 150 watt light bulb on the inside of a pumpkin will cook it pretty good. But that's another story for another day. But God shines through us. Matthew 5, 14 to 16, Jesus said, what? Let your light so shine before men. That's what you want to do. You're that city that's set on a hill. Uh, I expect you to shine. The world's filled with darkness. If we don't shine, who will? And those words are still true tonight. Ephesians 5 and verse 8. Paul said, you're children of light. Walk as children of light. In other words, act like it. And that's something all of us need to do. Philippians 2 and verse 15. Uh, a verse about light. Again, to the pagan Gentile a wicked Roman world of that day which mirrors our own on so many uh, areas and facets. What does Paul give as instruction? He said, become blameless and harmless. And that idea of become really means to prove it, demonstrate that you are the people of God who are blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, 
in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. As things still described in that way today, well, I think so. This is still a crooked and perverse generation, but Paul says you're to be harmless, you're to be blameless, you're to be without fault. Again, that doesn't mean without sin, but it does mean sin shouldn't stick to us. We shouldn't go along to get along and conform to the ways of the world. No, we're different because, the last part of the verse, you shine or should shine as lights in the world. That's what he wants us to do. He wants to shine through us. God shines through us. Now, admittedly, those who are in darkness, they don't like the light. You remember Jesus said as much in John's gospel. He said, they won't come to me. Their deeds are evil. They don't want to be exposed to the light. And if you're in a dark room and someone turns on, uh, you know, a flashlight right into your eyes, you're going to recoil from that. And maybe there's some lessons and connections with that, with how we approach people with Christianity. We don't just try to blind them, but we try to say, here's a light to be guided by. God shines through us. Well, what do you think of when you see a jack-o'-lantern? Do you remember that you're handpicked by God? That He selected us? He had a plan called the gospel that His Son Jesus unfolded and paid with with His own blood? And that he chose you and me who respond to that message to be adopted as his children. What a wonderful thought. Do you remember that God washes us clean? And that sin that stains and soils, dirties and defiles our lives, he washes off by the blood of Jesus when we obey his gospel. And we, we continue to walk faithfully. He continues to cleanse us. Do you remember that God gives you a smile? We need to wear that smile. We need to wear it every day, and we need to live in such a way that God's light shines through us. These points of the gospel plan of salvation we've already made tonight. There's no need to review all of them. You know the steps that are involved. You heard the part that Jesus played in your salvation, and you know that if you're not a Christian, here are the steps that you should take. And we hope tonight that if you're one of those who needs to take uh, this course of action, you'd gladly do that because that puts you, you see on screen, in Christ in him as a child of God again walk and he'll wipe and he'll clean live with that smile let his light shine through you tonight if we can help you we hope you'll allow us that opportunity if you'll come now as we stand and sing together why keep Jesus waiting waiting